inspiring ideas that propel the business community forward. And now, Connect with KB. This is Kristen Bouncer, and this is another episode of Connect with KB. My guest today is a first-term state representative who recently worked on legislation to expand beer distribution for microbreweries throughout Michigan. Joining me is Pauline Wenzel, the state representative from the 79th District. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am so um, excited for you to be able to tell the Pauline Wenzel story because I I think it's a really good one. So why don't you share with the listeners kind of who you are and what's the backstory on Pauline? All right. Well, I grew up in Michigan um, on a small fruit farm in Southwest Corner, and my family's been here about six generations. Um, and I grew. I actually live right now about a road over from the family farm. Um, so, I'm Southwest Michigan, born and raised. I love Michigan. I uh, went to Michigan State University, and after graduation, I've always loved travel. So, I worked for a while in a museum, which I absolutely loved. I'm a history nut, um, and then I decided to travel for a while. So, I've been to over 60 countries. Really? And after coming back, oh, people nice. were, you know, always asked me, "Why? Why are you back? Why did you come back to Michigan?" And it's because after visiting 60 countries, um, Michigan's a great place to live, and that's where I wanted to come back to. And I started working for a family business um, in marketing, and that's how I got uh, introduced actually to the beer industry. Uh, we sold a lot of our fruit products to um, our breweries. Um, it was a booming industry in Michigan. Fruit beers were becoming really popular. I thought, hey, this is a kind of a neat thing. We should start reaching out to these breweries. And it kind of took off from there. Um, and then also, you know, once I was back, a lot of my friends were gone um, when I came back from traveling because there weren't jobs, really, in Southwest Michigan. And a lot of them were talking to me about, oh, you're so lucky to be able to live back at home. We wish we could come back. And that was one of my motivations uh, to run for office. It was not something I thought a long time about, um, but it seemed it was the right time. And I thought we needed more young women um, in in politics. And I thought that if I could make a difference in, in Michigan and help my friends be able to come back and, and live around their families and live in Michigan, that was something I wanted to do. Well, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that journey in just a second. But first, let's talk about this uh, legislation that you just spearheaded to expand the beer distribution for Michigan brewers. How did you get involved in that? And what was that process like? Well, um, for a very large beer package that's Pretty complicated. Uh, the process started pretty easily. I was at my local brewery, Arclight Brewery, uh, that I frequent very often, and I was talking to one of the brewers there, and he said, "Hey, we have this problem, and we can only self-distribute up to a thousand barrels, and that's including our taproom sales, which isn't very much." And down in Southwest Michigan, I have 22 breweries in my district, so that's a lot. Um, we're a tourist area, and they were all having this problem. I talked to a couple of the other brewers, and they said, "Yeah, it's a huge issue. Uh, we have to sign on with the distributor before our brand is." is well known enough. Um, and so then we're paying for a distributor to go into stores, but nobody's buying the product because they don't know us well enough yet. So I said, hey, this sounds like an easy enough fix, right? Well, I've learned in Lansing that nothing's <laughs> uh, quite an easy fix. So we got the ball rolling. And uh, eventually, uh, we have some other um, uh, bills in there that change some things, but the, the main part of the bill was um, just upping the distribution, which sounds simple. Uh, so we're at um, 1,500 barrels now, I believe, with taking taproom sales out of that. So, But there are other states, I mean, that they have just thousands and thousands of right. barrels. Why is there this limitation really here in Michigan? And, and really, what's, what's stopping, stopping the state from going higher? Well, the reason we decided on that number is, um, as you know, everything is baby steps in right. Lansing. So sometimes moving the needle in the right direction is, um, is uh, what you can accomplish at the time. And it, being in the business that I was before, but by the time that you, you know, breweries, they're not distributors. They don't want to be distributors. Dealing with trucking and everything that goes along with that is difficult. They want to make good beer. And the same thing um, when in my industry, we were selling our frozen fruit to lots of grocery stores, and we used to distribute our own. And we got to a point where it was just too much, and we went to um, our wholesalers. So the same concept that we, we figured out, and we talked to a lot of people in the industry and a lot of stakeholders, and that was the number we decided. Once you're to that point, you're going to want to have a distributor anyways. So, And taking out the taproom sales was actually a really big thing, because a lot of our brewers, depending on where they're at and where the taprooms are located, they're doing a lot of the, that. Their sales was almost all through their taproom sales, and that shouldn't be included in your, in your distribution. Did COVID heighten the need to do this, or did it slow it down? 
it well the process was already um, happening so I don't think it, it affected it but it definitely came at a good time because it, it is helping our brewers are hurting there's no doubt about it and this is just one of uh, many things that we're looking at to, to help them during um, come back from COVID you are also um, you're on the energy committee yes what particular issues are you working on right at the moment? Oh, well, energy is such a, a big topic. I've, it's taken me, I've been in office about a year and a half now, I guess, almost exactly, and I'm just learning about um, energy, anything related to energy, as much as I can every day. Uh, I, I love the topic. We have two nuclear power plants very close by, one in my district, one right outside. Um, and uniquely, I am the only um, district, well, Berrien County, so is the only area that does not have consumers or DTE. Wow. In the whole state of Michigan, including the UP. So uh, we have Indiana, Michigan power. Um, I have a propane tank. Uh, and I, my whole family has propane, so it's I, I'm involved in a lot of different. Uh, we have solar, a, a, a big solar uh, field was just put in in the town that I live in. So I'm learning every day about energy. And what we're working on right now is just uh, they changed the law as, uh, right before I got into office, so things are just kind of settling now. So it's a lot of just learning about all the new renewables and how we are going to go forward with that. A lot of things with. Um, electric cars and charging stations, things like that. Well, you know, the energy industry and sector is is really on the cutting edge. I mean, obviously through COVID, I mean, there was no stepping back. I mean, power is going to continue and Mm -hmm. we are going to need clean energy and renewables and all that type of thing. Let's talk a little bit about your experience being in the legislature. And, you know, what are some of those things that kind of surprised you about serving and uh, your place in the caucus and some of the some of the kind of first first steps for you when you got in in terms of what was an eye opener. Well, Michigan, as we're all well aware, is a very diverse state, um, from the UP to Southwest Michigan to the East Side and everything in between. And so, getting to Lansing, being one of 110 state representatives, um, how unique we all are, and how well I think we all represent our, our districts, but how different we all are. And remembering that um, when I was here, that we're all here ultimately for the same purpose, is to make Michigan better and to represent um, the people that we serve. And keeping that in mind when we're sometimes in disagreements and and thinking that um, you know, everybody has a different background, grew up in a different way, and that's what makes you, Michigan, I think, so unique. And so that was um, an eye-opener, but something that I really enjoy, and I still enjoy. Uh, everybody comes from such different backgrounds and professions, and just trying to all work together at different ages. Um, it, it, it's a unique experience that I, I'll never... Um, have anywhere else. Well, you know, as you kind of continue this journey and you're up for re-election this year, it came a lot faster than you thought it would, didn't it? Oh, yes. Everybody told me it would, (laughs) and I didn't believe them, and it flies by. Uh, What are those things that you feel that you're doing in serving your district? Um, You know, I've heard some great things about you, that you have served your um, constituency and your district with honor. What exactly does that mean to you? Oh, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. For me, my most important lesson that I've learned and something that I, I take to heart is just listening. Listening. I'm not always going to agree, um, but listening to my constituents, listening to what they have to say, uh, always have an open door and taking all of the information that I can from experts, whether it's in my district or around Lansing or around the state or the country, I should say, um, and taking all the information and making the best decision possible and the decision that I think will be best for my district. Is being a a woman in the legislature um, had a bearing on you in regards to how you see this and your influence? (laughs) <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, we argue that all the time, I think, between uh, myself and some of my male colleagues and female colleagues. Um, there's definitely a difference between men and women, and, and um, we, all, we, we all laugh about it sometimes. But I think it does give um, a unique um, perspective. And my, you know, being a, a younger female also, uh, I am a millennial. I'll say that loud and proud. <laughs> but um, I have a different uh, skill set and a different experience as well. And um, I think that we all bring a different perspective, which is what was the point of uh, the legislature and the caucus. Um, we definitely don't all agree. And I would be terrified if we did, because you need that, um, you need that different the disagreements and the different perspectives to yeah. make Good policy. Absolutely, for sure. What are some of the things that you'd like to work on that are important to you about your district? Well, uh, when I came to Lansing, a, a big issue was car insurance, and we did get that passed um, last year. So that was a big, uh, big win for the um, whole state. 
And some other things I'm working on, criminal justice reform is, is top um, priority for me. Um, and helping our small businesses. I mean, things are changing now uh, from when I first got into office, obviously with COVID. And helping our businesses rebound, um, helping our economy get back on its feet. And still, um, as what I ran on before, is getting young people back to Michigan. I know that we've lost population, and I know that Southwest Michigan in particular uh, has lost a lot of population, and we're one of the oldest populations in the state. And that's a problem. Um, so that's always going to be at top of my priority. You had, um, I suspect, over the last four months, have played an integral role in helping people with their unemployment. Yes. Yeah. And did you have, or your team have, problems getting through the system, like, you know, you heard people saying all the time that it was just a challenge being mm -hmm. able to get one into the system, get the thing processed. And so I heard that a lot of people were reaching out to their state rep offices. They were, yes. We had, I think, almost a thousand, if not even more than that, um, just like every other office. And um, I guess the best word I would use to describe it was a nightmare. I mean, when you're getting calls from people that can't, I mean, they're heartbreaking. And knowing that you can't do anything about it, uh, as an elected official, uh, it's very hard to say, I'm sorry, I can't do anything else. That's nothing, that's something that you you don't want to say, especially to people who are just trying to, I mean, feed their families and, and they're, they're calling and they're almost, it's almost, it was heartbreaking when you hear, they don't want to annoy you. And I'm like, well, you're not annoying me. I want to help in any way I can. And they're like, you know, we've held off as long as we can. We know everything's backlogged, but we're desperate now. And it, it was just, it was not good. Yeah, no, I, I know that. And I've heard that from other offices as well, that it was just, um, very, very difficult for people. And I think there's people out there, too, who still have never received any money. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the legislature and the process right now with serving. And you're in this week. Mm -hmm. um, and how is that going in terms of where you're sitting and <laughs> social distancing and... Has that made it really difficult to legislate? It does. A lot of people come to the chamber and they watch us when the balcony is open. Right now it's closed to the public. And they say, do you do anything? Do you guys do anything? It's so slow down there. Because um, from an outsider's perspective, in fact, my first couple of days on the floor, I thought the same thing. It's very slow. The voting takes a long time. But it's the uh, in personal... Um, the, the, talking to your colleagues, walking around the desk, um, talking about legislation, talking about what you're working on, things like that. Um, and, and so we are working. That's what we're doing. Now with social distancing, it's made things a lot harder. Uh, quite a few of us are actually in the balcony to uh, separate people more. I am one of those. I will say that the balcony benches are not very comfortable. Uh, when you're sitting up there five, six, seven hours sometimes, it, it gets a little hard and your legs get a little cramped. But uh, we're, we're getting by. But it's definitely changed the way we interact. Now instead of going and talking to a colleague, you're calling them on the phone and looking at them from the balcony and then they can choose to ignore you sometimes too which makes things uh, even more interesting <laughs> yeah well th you can see them ignoring yes. you now that makes it even worse <laughs> do you think that um that covid has uh been dealt with correctly from the state perspective uh, you know i think time will tell yeah, I think this is something that we're going to look back on in five years or I, my grandchildren are going to look at me and say, oh, my gosh, Grandma, I can't believe you were in the legislature during COVID. Tell us all about it. You yeah, know, who would have ever thought it's going to be something that we'll be talking about for, I'm sure, for the rest of my lifetime. What are some of the greatest lessons that you've learned on this journey prior to coming into the legislature, but specifically to now that you're in office as a state representative? I would say um, I've always been one to trust my gut and listen to that voice inside your head. And if you can follow that and trust that, um, you'll be just fine. You have, um, at, are you 30? I am. 30 years old. What do you think are those kind of next five, 10 years look like? I mean, you wanna, obviously, you, you know, you, you would be termed out at some point in time. Um, can you see yourself running for other offices? I can't say that that's out of the question. Um, for me, I'm a, I'm a very organized person that plans ahead, but uh, I learned when I was traveling to keep things open, keep an open mind, and that's where you experience some of the best things in, in life. Um, and that's how I'm going to go forward. If I had, I never planned this, and if I hadn't kept an open mind, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So I, I would like to plan my next few years, but at the same time, so many things can change in life that I'm just keeping an open mind and see where this all takes me. How is the relationship with people on the other side of the aisle? 
Depends on the day. <laughs> and the issue, I suspect. And the issue, yes, uh-huh. exactly. But you must have some colleagues that you can work with. And oh, definitely. And it's been an opportunity for you to learn from them as well. 100%. Like I said before, that we all have such unique backgrounds, and they're such great people, and we all just want the same. Um, we want a better Michigan, and that's what we're all striving to do in our own ways. Some key takeaways here for you in regards to what this looks like for the next year. Uh, obviously, you suspect that you're going to get back in in November. Yes. Um, any big things on the horizon for you in 2021? We've, we're working on some things, but time will tell. Uh, things. The one thing that Lansing has taught me is patience. Nothing happens fast here. That is, the, that is for sure. <laughs> I do want to tell you that um, I appreciate the team that you've built uh, over in the 79th district. I am a big fan of Abby Sealars, and she does a championship job for you. And so I want you to keep up the great work. Thank you. You bet. Appreciate I'm, it. I'm glad that you joined me today. Thank you. Yep. Uh, my, uh, my guest today has been State Representative Pauline Wenzel. She represents the 79th district. I want to thank my supporting sponsors, Marketing Resource Group, White Law, Downing Industries, Governmental Consultant Services, AF Group, AT&T, and the Loomis Law Firm. You can listen to all of my podcasts at connectwithkb.com. Until we connect again, go live your best life. I'm your host, Kristen Belter.